be great to have another set of eyes that, you know, I know you all have reviewed it before, um, but just make a recommendation to council, I think would be kind of- I don't know which one this is. Does that sound something like, um, Pete, you would be interested in kind of- uh, Yeah, absolutely. The uh, planning commission is uh, more than willing to continue reviewing. Uh, the suggestions that were made. Uh, we had gone, I had gone through the, the paperwork and I noticed there were some issues that were not even addressed uh, by uh, Pima. So I'm making that list because uh, we had made 16 recommendations way back when after October of last year when we were given the okay to start reviewing. And then because of the virus and everything, everything is put on hold. Uh, so yes, we definitely want to continue. And uh, I guess, Paula, we can talk about whether or not we're going to have an in-person meeting this month or, or is that because the planning commission is next week. Do you think we're going to get an okay to be in person? Only the reason why I ask is because the kind of discussion that we would be having it is a lot of back and forth and back and forth. And this, this medium is okay, but it doesn't really, it's not ideal for that kind of back and forth discussion. Uh, yeah, because as of right now, the offices are, or the borough hall is closed. What do you think, David? You know, I would say for something like this, um, you know, if all of your members are comfortable with it, you know, in the yellow phase, I don't, really see a reason that we can't mm -hmm. do it um you know the the guidance is still to for work or uh, you know i would count this as work is to, to telecommute where possible um but i think that we leave some wiggle room right if you're saying this is the kind of thing that it's not really possible over zoom then you know i would say you know yes you have the green light to go ahead and do that um the only thing we should probably plan for uh, and we should plan for this anyway, because it's going to come up with council, is that when we do go back to in-person meetings, how are we going to, we should find some way to provide a forum for public comment for folks that are still uncomfortable going. Um, so I'm not sure what that would be yet, but we can think about that in the coming days. Right. Because right, that, that's the one thing I could see, is that some people wouldn't want to come, but might sure. still have something to say, which is probably more of a concern for council than planning commissions, but they are all technically public meetings. Correct. Correct. Okay, I guess we'll have to think about that over the next few days. Uh, so yeah. I'll plan how about if I plan on having a planning commission meeting next Thursday in council, we'll separate by at least six feet. We may have to rearrange some chairs and the like, uh, and then we'll just take it from there. Yeah. I, I, they said, if you're all okay with that, it's, and two, in-person meetings, they're going to be easier for the, the commissions and the boards because they're smaller than when it's full council. Um, so yeah, if you want to do it and spread out, I'd say go ahead. Okay. Um, Paula, can I ask a question about the Pima suggestion? Sure. Mm -hmm. Did they, even though their draft may have what's acceptable to them, did they mm -hmm. offer any, any comments? about the um like the 200 foot versus the, the 600 square foot is there like company uh, accompanying uh comments of what could make that possible anything that's in that draft is what they felt comfortable with so if they did not feel comfortable with it then it was not put into that draft and do they say what would make them feel comfortable like if they're not comfortable with 600 does that mean they're not comfortable with 600 period or that they're not comfortable with 400? I think it could go under 600. 600 seemed like it was, it was a sticking point to them that that was just too big. Okay. okay we should look back and see, cause I know that that was one of the things they were a hard no on. Right. Like they were hard no above 600. If they and it was a recommendation, not a requirement, and that's really a big sticking point with a lot of people. That these are all recommendations in order to stay, you know, within our, our CRS, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not 
a requirement. And that's, that's where you as council have all the leeway to, you know, say, you know what, we're okay with 600 and, and, and we can work with that because there are a number of properties, especially on the south side of the uh, floodplain, you know, by the apartments, they're quite large enough to handle that according to all the zoning requirements. Um, they, you know, you can put it on any one of those properties and quite a few on, on in Rivermore too. That right. they we'll meet all to, the other zoning requirements. We'll have to clarify that and maybe look back and see what we have because uh, I, I remember, Paul, I was on one call with you and Wes. It was like early in the morning. We had a right. review and I, I thought that even on that call, they said under 600, like I thought they stuck to 200 was my recollection. Right. So we can dig through and, and see what the, what the final result there was, but that's how I recall it. Right, and I'm sure Leslie Rhodes would um, chat with us again. She was very informative. Yeah, she, she was good. She was knowledgeable and good. Yeah. yeah. I, th I, I, what I recall just vaguely, because I wasn't a part of these discussions, is that they may, maybe 600 would be acceptable if you filed a non-conversions agreement or something of that nature. Um, but I don't recall if they've ever said anything about like 400 or what right. would be acceptable. So yeah. that's something you would want to double check. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. The, in the reading that I have done, I've, they were suggesting and recommending a letter be written and accompanied with the zoning permit. Uh, my concern is that if we put 600 as a limit, you know, any 601, you do not need a variance. And under 600, you, I'm sorry, under 600, you do not need a variance. Above 600, you do. That would save the residents $850 of going before the zoning board to put up a simple vestibule or a garage or deck. If, but once, if, if you want to go and tell the residents, okay, if you want to do it above 600, then you're going to have to come before the zoning board, pay the application fee. Anything below 600, you don't have to pay the additional $800 because some of these projects to put up a vestibule, what's that going to run you? Two, $300? Uh, I'm sorry, maybe $1,200. Do you really want to have to go before the zoning board and spend 850 on a small project like that? Yeah, this is another area I know we need to review, and I know this was going to be a sticking point, um, mm -hmm. but I know that some of these limits, too, were not going to be eligible for variances at all. Uh, and, you know, the accessory structure portion, we'll have to check, that may have been part of that. Um, you know, I, I, again, it's been a while since we sort of went through the reasoning, but I was pretty certain that this was a line that was not going to be one we could really cross. Mm -hmm. um, the 600 line was not to be crossed. Yeah, we My to recollection is that the line. 200 line was not one to be crossed, but I, I oh. could be wrong about that. Um, I also recall that when we got that information, it, it, I remember it surprising me because we had been told other information before, um, but this was the first time I was on a call with someone directly from Pima where this came up. But I, I do remember that, that we were assuming that if we could have a little more leeway and she said essentially no. Um, Again, there were only recommendations. Right, and but it, in, the, in, the, in the framework of, uh, you know, I think council has agreed that we're not willing to jeopardize the CRS. So right. I think that was sort of the line. Sure, we could do it, but we would essentially no longer be in the program. Well, she, she was saying that the 200 line does not jeopardize the CRS. The 200 line doesn't, but the 600 does. Oh, above 600, but not below. Up to, well, no, 600, because it was, I think you wanted 600 square feet, and she had some odds over that. Okay. Because but we'll, so we'll reach out to her again, and because well, I know yeah, the we'll 600 square feet is a stickler for you, so we'll reach out to her again and get well, clarification. Yeah, you know, the reason why it's a stickler is because uh, I think I showed you the diagram of a 400 square foot garage. And mm -hmm. if you do a 400 square feet, you can physically pull in two very small cars. And that's mm -hmm. all you have room for. There's nothing else. But 
you know, most people have two cars, but they also have a lawnmower, right. and, you know, bicycles. Some have canoes because they're on the river. They need places to put this. And personally, uh, I would rather build a structurally sound garage large enough to house this rather than go to Lowe's and pick up a box and throw it in my backyard and, and, and hope that it doesn't float away to, to house that stuff. Right. So that's sort of thinking that structurally sound buildings are far more substantially uh, worthy than putting up a, a shed. Um, and, they, and they last longer. They also increase the value of your house. They're taxable, rateables for the borough. Uh, and I mean, I would just go on and on. But anyway, that's the concern and that's the thinking that it's worthless to put up a 200 square foot shed for anybody who wants to pull a car in or two or, or maybe have a, a hobby where they want to put a little woodworking shop because you can't do it. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, well, we'll get in touch with her. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll get confirmation on what, that, that, what, what the situation is there. Yeah, what yeah, the situation is and what is her reasoning. Right. I mean, out west, when, you know, they have floodplains out there and, and they build huge barns. And, and you know, you're talking right. 20,000. So believe me, I, I get it. And I understand why people want to be able to do it and why they should be able to do it. Um, you know, if it jeopardizes CRS, that's not really our decision. So, you know, it, it really yeah. just comes down, their answer is their answer. And yeah, I don't think that, <laughs> that becomes it. I understand well, very to. much. I just don't think it's going to jeopardize the CRS because it's a recommendation, not a mandatory minimum requirement. And that's what jeopardizes your CRS if you don't meet the minimum requirements. And we do. We'll we'll get confirmation from them. Yeah, and we just need to know their reasoning and how Mm -hmm. it affects the CRS. Mm -hmm. Will do. Um, And I guess there's some other conflicts. And like, you're permitted to build in a brownfield. Our ordinance says if you have a contaminated area, it's a brownfield, you're permitted to build in it. And that's a real conflict. It doesn't make sense. So we got it. That's another one we have to review. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, we don't have a brownfield in the floodplain. Yeah, but there's no new construction in the floodplain. So that, that ordinance controls. Well, there would be, it doesn't have to be habitable construction. Well, you can put a parking lot in the floodplain. I don't think I don't think there's a um, I don't think there's a distinction though. That that was a proposed idea that that really doesn't fly. Was the habitable versus inhabitable? Right. Right. So in areas where zoning conflicts with floodplain, the stricter of the two controls. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. And right. we have to decide how strict we want our floodplain to be. Correct. And still remain within the CRS to meet their minimum requirements for the CRS. Correct. And there were a number of things that we found we could loosen as, as part of this. And one right. of them I know was the, the driveways. Is that, was that in the most recent draft? Because I know we talked about that. We talked about it, but I don't think it was in there. I it's think what we would it. like to do is make it um, pervious. And, if they, and, did I, and they okayed that, right? They okayed right. That. I know they yeah. did, but so I think she just forgot to put that in there. It's actually already in our ordinance that we can do driveways to uh, residential properties. The question is whether we can do it to commercial properties if we wanted to expand. No, you can't put a new driveway in in a floodplain. Oh, well, according to our floodplain, we can. No, because we have, we have an issue in one property because they put in a brand new driveway. Well, the, the zoning officer asked me to actually look that up and I sent him the reference for it because he had said that uh, there were two people or there was a, someone who wanted to buy a house, but they couldn't put a driveway in, so they did not want to buy it. Mm-hmm. And he asked me to look that up and I sent them the reference for it. So, and I can look that up again if you like, that's, that's not a problem. Um, so th- there's just some odds and ends like that are, that are conflicting that we have to go through again. Uh, yeah, and it just seems like there seems to be an issue with with what is mandatory and can affect the CRS versus, you know, what does it mean when they say recommendation? And is there a difference? 
And mm -hmm. what does it mean when they say affect the CRS? Does that mean it's going to affect our current discount or possibly affect future discounts? Like, I, we need to know what it precisely means. Okay. You know. and, and we got, what, a 5% discount last time? I believe so. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, so people are not allowed to improve their homes, businesses like Yardley Inn. Right? And what, what are they going to do for a 5% discount? Is you know is it really worth five percent? That's five percent is a lot well, to some people though. So right, and the goal here was always to get to ten, and I know right, and right, our we're close. Payers are paying like five thousand dollars a year. It's well, oh, I know, I know. Yeah, and we're getting close to the ten. So it just gets to know what the decision yeah. point is. Okay. Yeah. Then on the other end, uh, Ryan brought a good suggestion about restarting the business enhancement team. Um, I reached out to Jeff Bueller. Um, so basically he has um, a good connection through Experience Yardley with the businesses in town. So he's gonna kind of introduce me as the chair of this committee. Um, and then, you know, we're gonna start outreach to businesses and see what better way um, we as a borough council can work with the businesses uh, in town to make sure they're successful. So that's an initiative um, I thank Brian for, but I think it's something good that we could kind of talk about in this forum here to talk about how we can better improve uh, the environment for our businesses. And um, I think it's going to be a positive thing. Uh, more outreach to those entities I think would be great. So that's the kind of second thing I just wanted to bring up. And I, I want to get right for um, you know, bringing that idea forward, which I know Jeff had started and, you know, I think the businesses, and at least his opinion, that the businesses really appreciate the outreach um, by the council. So, will you include the YBA as well? Yeah, we should. I think I think we can include mm -hmm. partnership with them. Yeah, and absolutely. I know. You know, like I said, and then just the businesses individually reaching out and and touching base, and you know, a lot of them. Um, you know, and I even just started, you know, when I order food, <laughs> checking with the business owners, you know, is there anything we could do, you know, mm -hmm. council. just starting that outreach, I think, uh, will be a good partnership moving forward and, uh, we'll make them feel good about, you know, our government. Sure. Yeah. I do feel like that's a good initiative that we lost and it'd be good to bring it back. Mm -hmm. No doubt. And especially during the time too, during the pandemic. And I think it's really good that we outreach and kind of check in. And I know, um, Paula, you've been doing some good work um, with the zoning um, and outdoor seating. And we're going to talk more about that at council tonight. But mm -hmm. um, I think it's all positive. And I think that's part of, you know, getting people to feel good about local government is important. So. Absolutely. All right. Um, Ryan, you have anything to add there? or um, So that's kind of the first step is with Jeff kind of reaching out to them because he's worked with them as borough councilman, now is in his position to experience Yardley. Also adding the other end, reaching out to YBA. I'll do that and, you know, kind of move this partnership forward. Yeah, I thought he had a good network as a good basis and he may have taken it in a direction that was probably what led to experience Yardley, but that doesn't mean there aren't other opportunities. No doubt. You know, so I think, yeah, that, that was just my suggestion. All right. Yeah. Appreciate it. So um, anything else? Anyone have anything for the good of the order? Um, not really. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel like everything's been covered. Does it look like is there any word on the street about how many of our businesses from an economic point of view are going to recover after this and how many we may, may lose? No, I haven't heard anything. Anybody's guess. Yep. Yeah. All the restaurants I think are, are doing well with the takeout and now with what we're going to be talking about tonight, I think they will be okay. Um, I haven't heard anybody really, the book lady is selling stuff online. So I think they're, they're doing okay, as well as can be expected. Yeah, in my, my conversation with Jeff and, you know, in his role with Experience Yardley, he seems to think people are struggling, but, you know, they're being creative and, mm -hmm. and 
the restaurants to take out has been big and they're really looking forward to starting to reopen and sure. that's the thing as long as it's not a bad rebound with with cases hopefully they can reopen and things just get back to normal right but if they have to close again that's going to be rough yeah, and I think that's the danger in the fall. And if there's a second wave, so to speak, you know, once cold and flu season's hit, I think that could certainly be more disastrous for a lot of these businesses. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah, it's just one of those things. There's nothing we can really do about it, you know? Yep, it's a wait and see. But I'm optimistic we're not going to have to close again. Okay. And I'm sticking to that. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Sounds good. And um, I, I do think. So that'd be great too. And hopefully we can hopefully start meeting in person soon too. I, I do think that's important as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think the person. Yeah. I know. Like I kind of said, we might have to hold off with full council a little longer than the other things just because we're packed up there. Yeah. But, you know, we can start doing some things together, which will help. Mm -hmm. Which will help. Good. All right. Well, I'll see everyone. Uh, I'm going to adjourn the meeting and thank you all for showing up and we'll see everyone at Borough Council. Perfect. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you.